it starts with one thing. thing. I don't know why. It doesn't even matter how hard you try. Keep that in mind. I'm designed this rhyme to explain in due time. I'm at the Nokia Theater in Times Square in Manhattan for the CD release of Linkin Park's brand new record. I put my trust in you. In the mid-90s, the new style of metal that emerged was in fact called new metal. For me, as a longtime metal fan, it didn't have any of the hallmarks that I like about heavy metal music. The guys didn't look like metal guys, they had short hair, they had baggy pants, and it didn't really sound like metal. One thing. I don't know why. It seemed to take a bit of hip-hop and a bit of metal and a bit of electronica and I couldn't stand it. it doesn't even matter. And so the journey of this episode is to try and understand whether or not this new metal even belongs in the story of metal evolution. emerged in the mid-90s. It introduced a dramatically different sound and look to heavy metal. But where did new metal come from? To get started, I'm meeting with Anthrax guitarist Scott Ian, because the first time I heard metal mixed with hip-hop was when Anthrax joined forces with Public Enemy. So I'm hoping Scott will shed some light on the roots of new metal. We grew up listening to hip-hop in Queens and the Bronx. We were at the epicenter of that. I was listening to rap music since the time I was listening to rock, rock music, since the 70s. So Bring the Noise was our way to work together one of our favorite bands on the planet. Yeah, Chuck D rapping over my guitar tone, something I always heard in my brain. My rhythm tone and Chuck D's voice were made for each other. And we made that happen. You know, we were able to stretch our boundaries of heavy metal. It was so organic. We just decided, let's really fucking put our balls on the line and say, we know a lot of the world is not ready for this yet, but we don't give a fuck. We're doing this for ourselves. And most of the world at the time came along for the ride. Bring the Noise was so successful because it didn't sacrifice on either end of the spectrum. It was extremely heavy and thrashy, and you had a really propulsive beat. So certainly Anthrax did play a major role in bringing hip hop and metal together in a mainstream way within the metal community. They were the ones that said, metal guys don't have to wear black jeans and white tennis shoes. You can wear shorts and all of a sudden find some kind of connection with your inner, inner city self. People always say, you created rap rock or rap metal all that shit that started in the 90s with Limp Bizkit and Korn and that whole sound or whatever, new metal. And I'm like, man, I can't take credit or blame because I don't believe it. There's so many other bands involved. Faith No More was doing rap, hip hop type of stuff since the fucking inception of Faith No More. <laughs> You guys were always playing with that kind of slightly funk influence right. in the band. Where was that coming from? Well, I always liked funk and R&B music myself. I mean, as a bass player, it's kind of an interesting thing to play. But what we were trying to do is write things and do things that would really kind of stand the test of time. 
always from day one. Even if people didn't see it at the time, that was always what we, we, we tried to do. And as a bass player, I've always wanted to be forward, leaning hard on the downbeat. Traditionally speaking, rock basses are on the backbeat. I always thought it more as like an extra drum that's part of the uh, percussion attack. And it feels so good, it's like walking the glass. So a lot of things what we're doing is we're playing just these kind of weird rhythmic patterns. I guess it is funky because funk music is rhythm based, but it, we weren't really trying to be like a, bringing funky grooves necessarily into rock music. And I mean, the only band I knew at the time that had before that was Led Zeppelin. You look at a lot of the bands that had a lot of influence upon a lot of metal artists like Led Zeppelin. It was almost all groove oriented. Same sort of tempo. Look at Black Sabbath. Grooves are just really accessible. Grooves feel really good. So in a sense, this experimenting with different forms was revisiting of, of that. And that again, expands the audience. There's more people who are gonna get into it if they can get into a rhythmic structure that appeals to them. When it comes to mixing groove and heaviness, no band struck this balance better in the 90s than Rage Against the Machine which featured the innovative approach of Rage guitarist Tom Morello. When Rage was mm. just starting out, where did the inspiration come from to have that groove, yeah. rhythmic element in the yeah. music? What made that early batch of Rage songs was definitely the chemistry of the four musicians and what we brought out of each other. My contribution to that was my love of those huge 70 hard rock riffs through the filter of my love of punk rock and hip hop. So I started to compile these riffs and grooves and in Rage Against the Machine, as the guitar player, I was the DJ in the band. That got me thinking about the instrument in an entirely different way. While I still loved Randy Rhodes and Eddie Van Halen and Yngwie Malmsteen and all that, I thought, there's enough of that happening already. And I started to concentrate on the eccentricities in my playing. And all of a sudden, we started to hear something that we hadn't heard before. Corporations call Toyota stole before you realize They over flipping all the color Send they back the night Rage was actually out there as a unique band that was on top of the charts. They mixed things up quite beautifully and, and distinctively. But Pantera is not a bad bridge to new metal either. And people who like Pantera didn't have much of a difficulty getting over to new metal. <laughs> Terra was one of the most important metal bands of the 90s, and yet they are virtually impossible to categorize. Some call them thrash, others call them groove metal. But one thing's for sure, they introduced a style of riffing that added a new rhythmic dynamic to metal music. late 80s writing heavy metal songs, a lot of bands would save the money riff for the end or for the middle or whatever. But we saw that the money riff moved people. So it's like, why not make the whole damn song the money riff? <laughs> you know, any riff that moved the people, it was like, too infectious not to jump into that fracas with the people once we started playing. I think what makes Pantera so great is that they had hooks, they had groovy, instantly hummable riffs. So it was finding this fine line between extremity and hookiness and accessibility that very few bands can manage to do. And Pantera were all about, like, we are fans just as much as you guys are fans, you know? That was their whole thing. Like, they were always partying with fans. The feel of their records was based around the riff. And they played with a groove that none of the metal bands were playing with. You know, they played, you know, it's like Texas Swing meets thrash metal. So there was a lot of emphasis on how the crowd would react. The proof's in the pudding, you know, we gigged so much and it was all about attitude and the bond with the audience, you know? And that's what was special about us. By the early 90s, combining groove and heaviness in metal music was well established. 
but still, these bands were not called new metal. So the question still remains, when was the new metal subgenre actually born? And who was the first true new metal band? Bands like Faith No More, Rage Against the Machine, and Pantera pioneered a groove-based sound in metal music back in the early 90s. But the first band credited with actually creating the new metal style was Korn. So I'm meeting with Korn vocalist Jonathan Davis to explore the band's background and how it shaped their music. Yeah, I wanted to start by asking you how would you describe Bakersfield, the time when you were growing up, and how you think that kind of fed into the music you went on to make. It, it really had a big impact on me, the town itself, because it's kind of barren at parts, a lot of oil fields, farms, so you're into dirt bike riding or music. That was basically it. Um, at the time, Bakersfield was considered Nashville West. There was a lot of country music going on, Buck Owens, Hee Haw, that kind of stuff. But the band that got me into like, liking metal music was Pantera because those grooves were undeniable. They just made you want to move, do something, made you get up out of your seat and, and rock out. But I think the biggest band was like Faith No More. It showed us that you could do something different and heavy music that wasn't traditional metal. In regard to your vocal approach, you're very different than a lot of other vocalists. I just was coming out of what was coming out of my heart 100%. I just opened my mouth and sang. I wasn't trying to emulate anybody. I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just trying to come in, figure myself out, really. And I kind of fell into my own style. From all the different kinds of music I listened to, all mixed into one. So were your lyrical influences primarily coming from a personal yeah, place Yeah, just straight from a personal standpoint, stuff that I had to get out. The heart inside is this shit's gone right through my that's another thing that just really attracted kids to Korn was the realness of it. They'd never heard like a grown man just crying on a record and putting his emotion out there like that. It was like, it was unbelievable. Jonathan Davis, he had this interesting way of kind of like whispering, you know, he would bring his voice down really, really low. I can see, I can see, I'm going by. Can see. Making you think he's in like a mental institution that you're seeing inside of, of his own head when he would offer these really whispery little discussions. And then to actually explode would take those songs to a whole nother emotional level. He was just making music and, and creating these songs and these lyrics as therapy for himself. And so other people, you know, felt that sort of connection to the music. And so the band connected on a mainstream level because it was unique music, but it was also very personal. Is there anything else Korn did that was new and exciting for metal with that first record? Korn and bands of their ilk basically took guitars and they down-tuned them to previously unheard of levels. And, um, you know, that's what gives it the heavy sound. That's what gives it this thick, heavy, groovy kind of sound. So. You know, the down-tuning, to me, would be the number one characteristic of what makes a band new metal. All of us were detuning at that point. The difference was the introduction of the seven string, which I called the mud tone. It basically said that Van Halen and Randy Rhodes were dead, that the idea of that top-end, bright, aggressive thing was over. And it was the introduction to this Ross Robinson production technique. No top-end, all about the low-end, all about the bump. The way the low end hits, you know, uh, it, it moves something else in the in your gut that straight metal doesn't really have the ability to do. Nobody was doing like lower music like that, and we wanted something heavier and lower. So I got a five string bass because it has a lower string on it. Like the music could be heavier, you know, lower string. It's really weird because I don't even think Corn has a bass player. Because it's not really bass, it's a percussion style instrument in the band. I did a lot of like, just click sounds of rhythms. And I think that's where, I guess I ended up developing the style. Korn broadened the scope of metal music by experimenting with sounds and instrumentation that had never been heard in the genre. 
But they weren't the only California band that stretched the boundaries of metal in the mid-90s. Sacramento, was it a place where heavy music was popular, but also hip hop and other styles? Yeah, I mean, it was very, uh, it was a melting pot of all kinds of sound, you know? We grew up kind of in a, I guess you'd call it the hood, whatever, and um, our early roots, I think, musically come from a lot of different places, from disco to, you know, being in the beginning of new wave music. There's so much great music in all these genres, and why not just, you know, utilize what the best of whatever you like and put it in and, and hopefully be able to do it so it's not so contrived, you know, if it's just because it was for us, it was natural. Like we always looked at making riffs, you can nod your head to it, it had beat, pulse to it. And uh, that's from listening, I think, to, like, to early rap music. But we didn't think about bringing in a turntable into the band to add a hip hop element to it. It wasn't that at all. It was more for soundscapes, I think. turntable can introduce sounds and an approach to sound that the classic instruments won't necessarily be able to do. But at the same time, there are always those fans of metal music who would probably take an axe to a turntable. The turntable is a tricky instrument when it comes to heavy metal. The Deftones were able to use uh, the turntable as a real instrument, however, that I think gave new atmosphere to some of their songs. <laughs> Deftones and Korn created a sound that helped shatter some of the orthodoxies of heavy metal music. But still, new metal wasn't considered a new subgenre until Brazilian thrash metal legend Sepultura released their groundbreaking album Roots. Describe where you guys were at when you made that record. Well, one thing Sepultura always said to ourselves was a commitment was to never repeat the same album. No matter what happens, we're never gonna do the same album again. And we already done a lot of the fast stuff, so we thought, what else can we do, you know, to develop our sound? So we started messing around with, with rhythms, and that was awesome. And we're like, wow, this is really cool. Let's keep this going. We felt those grooves, you know, like metal has a groove, man. That's a great groove. When you do it right, it's killer. It's really contagious. Roots, opening track. Roots, Bloody Roots is a really total killer groove song. It's made for festivals. It's made for 50,000 people jumping up and down. That's what I still love to play today. It's one of my favorite songs to play live. Music. You have to do what you believe, you know, and then we believed in roots, you know, the band totally believed on it, so we just went on further. Max was basically the guy that spearheaded the movement, taking Sepultura in a new metal direction. So the album Roots definitely helped establish a genre right along with Korn and Deftones. When we heard them do that, we said, okay, if Sepultura is going to come from their roots, you know, excuse the pun, from their roots to doing an album like Roots, we all said, okay, new metal is going to blow up. That's why you had so many new metal bands coming out of that time. I mean, it blew up so quick that none of us expected it. We all had our head down and horns out and just kind of driving through the wind and American kids were ready to eat that up. New metal was engaging multiple audiences. Those bands were engaging the metal fans, they were engaging the goth fans, you know, and there were some rap fans brought into the fold. So that musical makeup broadened their appeal and they tapped into all those different fan bases. By the late 90s, 
new metal was recognized as a unique underground movement that resonated with heavy metalers as well as fans of hip hop and goth music. But how would new metal transform from a grassroots subgenre to a mainstream movement that swept across America and the rest of the world? I guess it would be nice if I could touch your body. I know that everybody has got a body like me. With the arrival of Limp Biscuit in the late 90s, the sound of new metal started to shift, and bands were now getting heavy rotation on MTV. But not everyone in the metal community was on board with this. A lot of fans, like myself, really didn't like what Limp Biscuit was doing with the sound of the music. But given that they had this massive mainstream impact, I'm meeting with Fred Durst because I want to know about the ambitions of the band and how they got their start. You know, I was homeless for a few years and sort of lost and just skateboarding and making crappy rap demos and I just didn't think anything was ever going to happen for me. But I remember hearing the corn were coming to town and I said, this is my shot, this is my shot. I got to give these guys my tape. After the show, they just walked out in the crowd and stood there. And we started drinking some beer and hanging. And I said, we can come back to my house. You know, I do tattoos. I'll give you a free tattoo. And for some reason, they were down with going. You know, we were playing this place called the Milk Bar in Jacksonville. And I guess this, they, those guys freaking that place. That was their bar. That was their club. And I remember us playing and being after stage. And I met Fred. And he said he was a tattoo artist. So I tattoo on uh, head. Brian Welch's lower back. And they bust my balls to this day because, you know, it says corn. But they say it says horn. <laughs> He, I mean, he wasn't a great tattoo artist. He kind of like swindled his way on the tattooing. So yeah, heads back says horn instead of corn. You know, we always tease him about it. It definitely doesn't say horn because there's one little piece in there that makes it a K and not an H. And so I gave him a tape. You know, I didn't realize how serious it was going to be, but Fieldy responded. He responded and he said, man, I'm going to let some people hear this. And I get a call from Ross Robinson. You know, to me, it was like, whoa, Ross produced Korn's record. Like, this is unbelievable. What was different about that Limp Biscuit sound? Well, actually, I kind of felt there was like a, a suicidal punk rock thing to it. Fred was singing about things like being pissed off at his neighbor and wanting to pee in their yard and, you know, just really adolescent things, you know, that made you want to, like, wreck something. But obviously he went like complete rap, so it was like an extra thing for metal, basically. Heavy metal and hip hop, the two worlds colliding together, I always kind of wanted it to happen. Even growing up, I would take rock records and a four track cassette recorder, recording the rock record on one track and then going and rapping over it. So when it came to Limp Bizkit, I absolutely went on a mission to make music that was a mixture of those. It's just one of those days where you don't want to wake up According to Limp Biscuit, new metal was going to be hard riffing, very groove oriented, and it was going to have very strict, very specific hip hop delivery. Other bands had elements of hip hop making them new metal bands. But Limp Biscuit, or basically admitting that new metal was about hip hop, that was what appealed to that mass audience. The hip hop and rap combined with, you know, the metal stuff, it was like, let's take all these things that sound violent and combine them all together. because. That just does something to you. It makes you want to move. It makes you want to dance in a way that metal wasn't making happen before. So we were constantly experimenting. What was your philosophy making turntables work in Limp Bizkit? When they asked me to join the band, I was like, you know, I don't want to just do like regular DJ fresh scratches that everybody's doing, you know? My stuff had to be musical. Definitely Tom Morello was an inspiration as far as how he tries to make other sounds with his guitar. I wanted to do more rock guitar things on the turntable. So I ran my turntable through a Marshall stack and I was like, that's it, that's it right there. The bottom line was let's have fun with it because you know, a lot of metal bands were just, you know, so serious and they're always, you know, like that and they gotta just be so dark. And we were like, man, you know, we can be hard and play hardcore and play riffs and like have fun too. Somebody need to come in and and start the fucking party. By 
1998, Limp Bizkit and the new metal movement was hitting the mainstream, and the driving force was the Family Values Tour, the first tour to be officially marketed as a new metal festival. Featuring headliners Limp Bizkit and Korn, Family Values played to nearly a quarter of a million fans, and new metal was now overtaking glam and grunge as metal's biggest subgenre. This was a very excessive time. It was like the 80s came back for a little while in the late 90s. Like, people are tired of seeing small shows. They want to see big shows now. They want to see big stage sets, big lights. And Family Values, being a huge production, made an impact. It made a statement. This is what's happening now. You know, it made us stand out as new metal bands on a new metal tour. It just kept building and building, and pretty soon it was like we were on our own, like where we could go out and headline as Limp Bizkit. Family Values was definitely the match that started that fire. To what extent was Limp Bizkit's approach more commercial than Deftones or Korn? I think at first, Limp Bizkit's sound and approach wasn't any more commercial than Korn's, at least on $3 bill, y'all. But when they built from that to Significant Other, they really made the cash grab. You have a single like Nookie, which for some reason blew into the stratosphere and was huger than huge. And in the mainstream eyes, that was a sign that new metal had gone supernova. Things were so out of control by that point, the audiences just ate it up. They couldn't get enough. I mean, it was ridiculous. I just remember thinking, oh my God, you know, I'm a rock star now. And now meeting musicians that I've always admired, and Hugh Hefner keeps calling me to come to his house, and I'm hanging out with all these playmates, and this is crazy. You know, I'm gonna eat it up while I can. I was just living, you know? I wasn't thinking too far ahead. What's going on? We're just shooting a video. Oh, we're shooting a video. We're not having this. Hey! 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 from the original Woodstock site, but of course, things are a little different in 1999 than they were in 1969. In July 1999, nearly a half a million music fans descended on the small town of Rome in upstate New York to commemorate the 30th anniversary of Woodstock. Among the dozens of performers over the three-day festival were Rage Against the Machine, Korn, and Limp Bizkit. What are your memories of that show? And what do you think it did for this movement of heavy music? Well, they were really pushing this movement hard. It was like this breakout metal festival with a few other artists sprinkled in. I remember getting there and just going, oh my God, look at this place. This is Woodstock. What an honor, how amazing. I mean, it was definitely the highlight of rap metal music. For us too, it was crazy. I think it was the greatest show we ever played and are ever gonna play. It was just amazing to play in front of 400,000 plus people and them all get it and be right there with us and feel what we were doing. It was amazing to see people jump into music and because there's so many people seeing how the sound travels, seeing the waves as people jumping. And it was just ridiculous. Woodstock 99 was unforgettable. That was a pretty big moment. That was, a, that was the biggest moment in our career. Because it was so intense. Never done anything like that before. Still haven't. We rocked that place that first night. And everybody had fun. The second night, the biscuit fucked it up for everybody. <laughs> It really did. You want the worst? Well, you got the worst. The one, the only, Lil Biscay! 
I mean, it was wildfire. There were people everywhere. And when we finally went up to, to play, it was like middle, middle of the day, and we had like the best slot to where the energy would be super high. So we just got up and we played our show. We walked on stage and it was that wave of people bouncing as far as you could see hundreds of thousands of people and it was the most amazing adrenaline pumping moment that i've ever experienced and i was so amped and ready to rock and we just did what we do but i guess things started to go bad during you know our song break stuff You know, it is what it is. It was just me doing my thing. Because during our performance, I saw people surfing on plywood. That's some tight shit right there, that crowd surfing on the plywood. I was like, that's fucking amazing. How cool is that? I'm gonna go do it. So I jumped down off the stage and I go out in the crowd and I'm telling them to bring the plywood over here and they're, they're surfing it over and I get up on it and I'm just start rocking on the plywood. You know, I'm, I'm partying with you guys. You know, I wanna be out here in the crowd with you. This is amazing. I had no idea there was anything negative going on at all. You got a job problems. You got a problem with me. You got a problem with yourself. It's time to take all that negative energy and put it the fuck out. I don't think they understood that I meant, okay, let's get rid of all that negativity so we can bring positive in. That means start j jumping, you know, jumping and singing. It doesn't mean start raping and, and burning the place down. That's definitely not what I meant. So come and get it. It's all about the easy, 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 easy. You better quit it. Talking that shit. Mom. So come and get it. I remember getting off the stage and having some policemen with my manager come around me and say, Fred, I think you kind of incited a riot. They started ripping down buildings and the scaffolding, and that's the plywood you were surfing on. That wasn't from walkways going to the restroom. They were tearing down things, and there's people getting hurt. And I go, I didn't see any of that. Everybody I saw was having an amazing time. Fred with his, like, come on, let's break stuff, that song, him doing that, it just sent it over the top, and that's when all that stuff happened. There was people hurt. People got beat up, hit, all this craziness. He instigated the whole damn thing. I was right there watching it. It wasn't a fun Woodstock type love fest. It really turned violent. It turned ugly. It was really a dark moment in music and instead of stopping the show, Fred Durst stoked the flames. Three days of music, peace and love ended with arson and rioting early today at Woodstock 99. Whatever the reasons, concert goers began destroying property, starting fires and rioting. Scattered bonfires raged out of control for several hours. Vending stalls were looted and light towers toppled. But was Woodstock 99's fiery end enough to shroud the event in regret? All I can say is that when we were on stage, our experience was it was the greatest concert of all time. And I had no idea that the finger would be pointed at me as a guy starting a riot. But I guess, you know, to this day, it's going to be something that Limp Biscuit fucked up. This music kind of started with the idea of making powerful music that had a message that was about integrity and unity and this kind of solidarity between band and crowd. And it became like, you know, a bunch of thugs raping women in the pit and then burning the festival to the ground. We popularized this genre, which now has just totally run amok. I just thought, man, this is like, what have we done? When I think of Woodstock, I think of that incident with Limp Bizkit. The stuff that happened there was kind of like the way Altamont was, you know, like you had the original Woodstock being this amazing music festival and Altamont being the point where like, you know, the 60s culture jumped the shark. Maybe that was the turning point where things had gotten out of hand. That music became excess and spectacle and disrespect to audience and peers in a way that you saw at the most awful heights of the hair metal bands this character Fred Durst thing, this monster that was created, you know, it sort of backfired on me. There was always negativity thrown at Limp Bizkit. Nobody really wanted us here in the first place. You know, nobody really wanted rap in the first place and nobody really wanted metal in the normal world. So rap metal, oh shit. Now the metal guys don't want it and the rappers don't want the metal. So I just think that it was, I'm just that guy, I guess. Yeah, maybe I'm that guy. Despite the fallout and backlash after Woodstock 99, the new metal movement didn't die, and in fact, it continued to grow. 
and it was so pervasive that even one of metal's biggest bands embraced the new metal sound. Tell me about Diabolus and Musica. What kind of direction were you guys going in on that record? I, that's a one record that I really paid not enough attention to because I was really bitter about what kind of music was popular. I thought it was was very frat boy stuff, and maybe that's why it was popular, I don't know. So Diabolus didn't get as much attention from me because, you know, we didn't stay in focus. Slayer were very influenced at one point by the power of new metal. The Diabolica album was very new metal, had very new metal elements throughout. Carrie's riffs changed, you know, the solos weren't as chaotic. So it was a little worrisome seeing that Slayer gave into that, you know, of all bands, Slayer, the kings of thrash metal, it's starting to sound new metal. You know, they're playing tours with the Deftones and they're playing tours with Korn and they're playing to that crowd and I think that had a lot to do with it. They wanted to connect with their audience. It's kneeling to what was popular, you know? Remember when Kiss went disco when we were kids? Trying to stay up with the times. Looking back, we were just saying, all right, how do we make Slayer fit into today's society? But that's probably my least favorite record of our history. That's our turbo. <laughs> <laughs> After Diabolus and Musica, Slayer returned to their thrash metal sound in the early 2000s, and it seemed that the new metal movement was starting to die off. But then a second wave of bands emerged that were labeled new metal, but broadened the sound of the subgenre and heavy metal as a whole. What was the music and rock and metal climate like at that time? It was a very uh, unique time because we got lumped into the category of new metal. But we never really had any association with that stylistically. We never rapped. We never had a DJ or a turntable or anything like that. Bands like the Deftones and Korn had their hip hop and rap influences. For me, it was much more reggae. I never really worried about what the categories were. We're metal, we're not metal, we're not metal enough, you know, we're rock, whatever. It, it doesn't really phase me. Obviously, we came up at a time where this whole new metal genre came up, and it was great for us. We were able to ride the wave of that because so many bands were getting snatched up at the time. The public had like had enough of Limp Biscuit, had enough of fucking corn. And it was just like the whole wave of new bands came through that kicked down the door for us. So it wasn't that hard for us to just stampede through and sell fucking six million records, you know? <laughs> the music industry at that time was very hungry. I mean, the best sales in the history of the music business were during that time. People were looking for bands that were that new metal style, but young, new, and fresh. The second wave of new metal bands not only expanded the sound of the genre, they also pushed new metal to even higher levels of commercial success. And the band that took new metal to its commercial peak was Linkin Park. I cannot do this anymore. Sing everything I said before. All these words, they make no sense. As you know, I mean, the next big band was Linkin Park. What was your impression of what those guys were doing? They did this really cool thing where they incorporated melody and singing with a rapper. So you had the best of both worlds. And it wasn't too heavy or spooky. It's stuff that, I guess, normal folk could palate. Everything you say to me, 
with Lincoln Park. There wasn't the same degree of overt harshness in the approach. It was a little bit softer, a little bit, it seemed like a little bit more of a gentle metal. And for that reason, you know, it had incredible commercial viability. When they turned it on and they were ready to go, I don't recall a band taking off faster than Linkin Park. It was 10 days from being this band that I knew as a band that played the Roxy to seeing them on MTV and being number one. Despite the massive success of Linkin Park and the second wave of new metal bands, much like glam metal back in the 80s, new metal's lasting legacy seems to be the way it deeply divided the metal community. And given that I wasn't a fan of this style, I'm still struggling to understand why new metal became so popular. Linkin Park fans, can you tell me why you like them? Why we like Linkin Park? Why do you like Linkin Park? Oh, they're the best. Like, we love the rock and the hip hop mixed in. They're original. Yeah. They're very original. Every album sounds completely different. What I like about them is that they've always tried to stay away from the conventional type of music. They don't fit in the genre. They are their own genre. They're Linkin Park. So how come I didn't like it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> Everyone has their own opinions. <laughs> Looking back over all this music that you've been a part of, what does that term new metal mean to you now? Well, I don't know how many people still use the term, but I'm extremely proud uh, to be part of the new metal movement. And I'm proud of everything that we have accomplished and everything we've fucked up. I felt proud that we helped innovate a movement. Very proud. Who cared whatever they call it, I guess, now. I mean, all I know is we're still here and we're still doing what we're doing and we're gonna call this the new middle godfathers for the rest of our damn life. So I guess I'm gonna deal with it. You know, it's a dirty word today, but not to the extent of hair metal. You know, like, people will turn their nose up at it and make jokes and stuff, but I think new metal definitely still has some kind of cachet to it. And it is still alive because those bands, they're just so part of the fabric of metal at this point that they're not called new metal. I think the term new metal has been kind of poisoned. And it's kind of a shame because the types of sounds that were being presented to audiences enabled them to open their minds and say, metal doesn't have to be rooted in this sort of Black Sabbath Metallica arc of acceptability. Maybe metal doesn't have to be one thing. <laughs> Before I set out to explore new metal, I questioned whether it even belonged in the story of heavy metal. But I've discovered that although the term new metal may be dead, many of the bands continue to thrive and have brought some real innovation to metal music. And so ultimately, I've realized that new metal has made a much bigger contribution to the evolution of heavy metal than I ever imagined. I know.